And Ron, Erwin LaCour, thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Hey, Ryan, my pleasure. Um, so you're the founder of MoveNet, and I think it's one of the first uh, like systems that I, I guess in the modern day put together these like more ancient movements to like get us tapped into our uh, like primal cells, primal movement. And um, I was, uh, I was, I've seen quite a bit of uh, the videos and like I watch UFC, I've seen Carlos, Carlos Condit doing uh, a lot of the movements. And I was just, uh, when I was preparing for the show, I was looking at like the, the history, like where uh, I'm assuming it's correct, like on Wikipedia where it says you got it from and where they get it from. Um, can we start with like, with uh, just like, where did you get it from? What, what made you, uh, take this route and, and start your, your own method? Um, when I was a little, a little kid, just like any other kid, you know, we all start that way. We start moving naturally. We start exploring, um, all the, that whole range of natural movement abilities, not just for the sake of fun or play, uh, though it's the way we learn, but it's not just about exploration. It's about acquiring skills, movement skills that enable, originally at least, would enable the human animal, the human beings to navigate through the world, which is originally nature, wild environments, um, to not only survive, but also to thrive. So to avoid threats and to uh, seize opportunities um, to, to just just live, right? So um, you, you have to be able to move. And that's why we have those instincts to move naturally in those very diverse ways, locomotion ways, manipulation ways, uh, even combative ways. Uh, that enable us to to move through the world, to perform physically through the world, to achieve the task that we need to achieve to just stay alive. Um, so when you say it's ancient and primal, it is ancient because it it has its roots in in the very uh, from the very beginning of of human evolution and before even the uh, human species. Um, but at the same time, those movement abilities are they're timeless. Mm. They're, if today you have, you would have a, say a vital situation that, that forces you to move, it's very unlikely that you're going to start assuming a yoga pose to get out of a tight spot, right? Or that you're going to play ping pong or that you're going to whatever, do some acrobatic movement you are extremely likely to just run very fast maybe to have up an obstacle to climb something or maybe to lift and carry somebody else and that's when the true nature of the true practical essence of those natural movements is revealed it's when you face vital circumstances and then what's left to do is to move the way you're supposed to move all right so Back to where I start. I start being a, a young human animals, uh, animal, moving in nature, being encouraged by my dad to climb trees and to jump off rocks and to crawl and to do all these movements. So not only it was a natural instinct, like in every young child, but it was also um, something that was fully encouraged by my own father, which which was great. And on top of that, I lived just next to the woods with boulders and hills. So a fantastic playground. Then I grow up, I do specialized sports, but I never really stopped uh, practicing the, the, those movements, though having that approach of practicality in my physical training doing what's practical, training the what's practical, being adaptable to a diversity of, of context. And then ultimately, it's in my late 30s or mid 30s 
that I discovered that there was actually a history of, you know, the history of physical education and people who had trained that way, the way I trained. And not only had trained it, but they had at least to some extent a method for training it. And I started to study it mm. and I realized how it, the foundation was great. Uh, the approach was, I fully shared the approach, but uh, how at the same time, the method needed to, to be updated, the communication about it needed to be updated. Um, so that's what I've done, and this is how I created the Move That Method, because I, I understood that that concept, that I, which I call natural movement, um, needed a, a place you know, to be recognized, to be acknowledged in today's society, and also not only have a, a, a place in terms of awareness, but also in terms, of course, of practice and developing this practice so that we can reach a lot of people who need this kind of, of practice, training. Yeah, um, I, I probably grew up uh, very similar. There were, uh, like with my dad out in the woods, like Southern Indiana has, you know, some hills and uh, a lot of woods. And we would um, go out like almost every weekend to the big state parks and the national forest and just race up hills and push down like dead trees and balance and pick up big rocks. And so it, it is, uh, uh, just interesting how, how natural it is and to wrestle and box and like you just naturally want to like fight your dad and and he'll like let you win sometimes and uh, it is it is an instinct mm -hmm. it is an instinct to hang and climb it is an instinct to crawl and get up and get down in diverse ways and to push and pull heavy stuff and carry and drag and lift and, and throw and catch and just, Again, there's a whole set of locomotive and manipulative and combative skills. At least they are natural instinctive abilities that we are all supposed to not only do uh, when we're young, but actually to, to keep going because originally we, it wasn't an option to possess those abilities and to keep them sharp, right? It was a necessity. Today it's not anymore. Today everything has become optional to the point where people can sit all day and just stand and walk a few steps and nonetheless they will survive. Nonetheless they will be, you know, fed and have other, you know, basic needs and more than that taken care for. But this is only a modern phenomenon. It's, it's, it's very recent that we've have that we've acquired such uh, comfort and luxury that enable us to be physically idle our whole life without at least without um, social consequences or even just a consequence for you know staying alive that is still not the case for uh, millions of peoples in the world um, and it was certainly not the case for for us as a species for the you know uh, overwhelming part of our history we had to be able to move we had to be able to hike we had to be able to run we had to be able to lift and carry we had to be able to be physical and physical in the sense of not just you know burning calories or doing machine exercise to be physical in the sense of real world practical tasks that if you don't do it then you know, too bad because you're not getting to last very long. Yeah. Do you, um, so you, you started off, you were doing uh, martial arts too, right? Like from, uh, and you kind of have, you like put some of that into the, into the system or how do you, uh, you were talking about like the combatives, do you have, uh, like some techniques that you, you like to use like in, in the in the group settings and so your ability to defend yourself to fight for a good or better reason but 
that ability is also one of those evolution, evol, evolutionary um, abilities. You look at kids and by instinct they flinch and by instinct they want to throw punches or kick or, or they want to grapple and they want to wrestle. They want to try to strangle each other or, you know, play with your joints and like both bowl them and try to hurt you, right? So again, it's a perfect example of martial arts of a an innate ability that is effective to some extent in a spontaneous, you know, in a, in a, in a again in an instinctual way, but that you can turn into very efficient skills through mindful, consistent practice using technique, right? This is what martial art does. Like uh, Bruce Lee said, you know, a thirst is just a, a punch is a punch, a kick is a kick, and mm -hmm. it's not a punch or a kick anymore. Then it becomes just a punch and just a kick. What does that mean? It means that at thirst, you throw things just like that without thinking, without knowing if you're efficient or not and probably you're not as efficient as you could be, then you start to pay attention. And you realize that to make the punch or the kick highly effective, you need to analyze, understand what makes it work, what makes it killer movement, you know, what makes it really, really good. Not only to understand the, 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 the details, the principles that make a kick powerful or punch powerful and effective and more than effective, just really efficient. And then you have to consistently practice to acquire those techniques to the highest level you can. And ultimately, you don't need to think about it anymore because mm -hmm. it has become fully assimilated by your nervous system. And what that means is that, again, at first you, you, you do things instinctively, you may be efficient and probably not. Then you pay attention, you have to be mindful to, and technical to become efficient. And then ultimately, you don't have to think about it anymore. But even when you don't think about it, you're still mindful. And you can perform those movements with high levels, levels of efficiency. So basically, you don't learn necessarily to be a great fighter by just going to a bar and offending somebody, insulting a guy, and starting a brawl. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you go to a martial art academy, and you learn from teachers to learn how to box, to learn how to tie box, or, or you know, you learn how to wrestle, you learn how to judo, you learn how to karate, or you learn all of that. But you get, again, those martial arts are the evolution of a primal instinct and a basic, innate but basic ability into mastered, evolved, highly efficient skills. All right. Now, if you understand that for basic instinct to combat turn into martial art, then you can apply that to any other movement. There is there, all these other abilities, innate abilities, the movement, which I call natural movement, that we all possess to some extent, but that we can turn into skills, techniques that you master. So apply that to jumping, for instance. Anybody can jump, very much, right? But does that mean that anyone can jump powerfully? skillfully land in a balanced way, in a stable way, in a control way, and jump not just in one way, but jump in multiple ways, multiple techniques with or without momentum, in diverse direction, upwards, downward, sideways, and then landing on diverse surfaces, some stable, some unstable, some narrow, some wide, some soft, some hard, some slippery, some, some rugged and with good traction. All of those diverse 
environmental variables that you have to deal with, right? We're not just a, talking about jumping up and down a square stable box in a gym, right? right? So if you apply that to jumping alone and you realize that to become efficient at jumping in diverse environments, there's a number of techniques that you need to learn and acquire and practice consistently and mindfully until they become master skills. Exactly the same as your primal instinct to fight turn into a martial art, right? And now you apply that to lifting and carrying. Now you apply that to throwing and catching. Now you apply that to climbing. Now you apply that to running, to crawling, to all of those natural movement abilities. And then voila, you have the very concept of movement which is to turn the full scope, the complete range of our natural movement abilities into mastered skills so that your level of movement competency as well as physical capacity turn into overall real world physical capability, right? Competency, we're talking about the skills, how well you move. Capacity, we're talking about strength, power, stamina, energy systems, all of that. You combine both, now you have complete capability. You're really capable. You're not just great at moving, but with that strength or with that stamina. Or you just don't have stamina and strength, but you, your movement skills are mediocre. You have both, full set, fully equipped. It's just like being a martial artist, a mixed martial artist, actually. But now it's like mixed natural movement, mixed movement skills. Which, by the way, um, all the sports that we practice, all the physical like uh, strength and conditioning and all, it's mostly based on those natural movement abilities. You, um, it is not, say, Olympic lifting that gives you the ability to lift. It's your natural movement ability to lift that enables the sports of weightlifting, of Olympic lifting, or of running, of martial arts, of playing soccer, whatever. All these specialized sports and activities are enabled by our universal set of natural movement abilities. Yeah. And so each sports turns one, usually one, uh, say lifting, uh, in a skill. Like a master efficient ability, that's a skill. So we have lifting. But then they're going to lift one object using two techniques, for instance. Mm -hmm. Not other techniques, not carrying, not other objects. So it's very specialized. Um, same with martial arts. Um, karate, boxing, just uh, boxing, just using your fist. Okay, karate. Or taekwondo, just using your legs. Karate, using legs and feet. Thai boxing, using legs and, and feet and, and, and knees and elbows and everything, which is also the original karate, um, et cetera, et cetera. But then they have specialized those martial arts because, we, again, we have an ability, an innate ability to wrestle, to, to grapple, to strike and parry. So why do we need to mix martial arts? It's because we specialize them in the first place. Mm -hmm. If we did not specialize them, we would not need to mix them. And they are not originally mixed. So mm -hmm. same with all those natural movement skills. It's not cross training. You don't need to cross or you don't need to cross train or to mix martial arts or to mix anything if you don't specialize in the first place. So move that is that approach where you understand that there's a full scope of mandatory uh, movement skills and none of them is optional and you will approach your training in that overall holistic way where you get a run, you get a crawl, you get a, you get a jump, you get a balance, you get a lift and, and carry, you get a throw and catch, etc, etc, etc. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm definitely with you on that. That is very interesting. What? So I teach. Uh, I I just call it like martial art. I don't even put like an S at the end. And 
Um, I work with like mainly like a couple like uh, karate black belts and um, some other people too. But like, so I'm not like trying to mess with their kicks and stuff. We work a lot, a lot on like jujitsu would be my specialty, but then that kind of puts you in a box where it's like, well, do they punch in jujitsu? Well, in my class you did. And like, it's kind of funny, like in my jujitsu class, like a traditional Japanese jujitsu to uh, move up in rank, we had to like break boards and break cement. And my buddy, who's a fourth degree black belt in karate, like a really good one, he never had to break boards or anything to get. So it was like this, this weird kind of thing. But I was going to ask you, like, so when you're working with somebody like a, a Carlos Condit and, and he comes to you and I, I don't know if he's still, uh, how often you uh, see him, but like when, when he comes to you and he's, um, I mean, his main thing is martial arts. So when somebody comes to you and they already have their sport or they already have their, what do you try to do for them? Well, Carlos County was a particular case and um, I trained him for two of his, of his camps. And um, so including the, the one for, he fought for the title. Mm-hmm. with uh, Robbie Lawler um, and um, you know what I I noticed a particular issue he had in his movement which was completely confirmed he was aware that he had it because he this had been pointed out by his team by his coaching so he was not surprised when I told him exactly the same, except that their specialty is, is, um, is not what I do. Mm-hmm. So um, giving, giving him reminders did not work at fixing him because he needed other tools. You know, these, these fighters are phenomenal athletes and they are they have to learn so many tools and to use so many tools and there are a bunch of tools available to to up their games. In this particular case, um, I I was helping him to become more stable in his standing stance, to be more responsive um, in avoiding takedowns Hmm. uh, and to move faster on his feet by changing his stance changing his foot position, changing the way he transitioned from one movement on on his feet to the next. Um, And that was it. So once this had had been uh, addressed and fixed, they don't need to work with him anymore because all the rest is taken care of by himself and his diverse coaches. Um, So yeah, every case is, is particular. So uh, it was not about having him doing the full scope of, of move that movements because that would have been irrelevant. We have limited time. He has limited time and energy to spend. You know, he cannot disperse his, his practice into uh, trainings, or drills that are not strictly relevant to prepping him for, for the next fight. So we did a lot of balancing, a lot of uh, jumping and landing, a lot of transitions like that, and a lot of uh, uh, training his nervous systems to be um, more alert and responsive in those particular stances and transitions. So that was, you know, I used a lot of my karate background actually to help him move that, but also of course, um, just pure move that training. And it just worked. I mean, the way he uh, he he knocked down or out almost. Um, what was his name? The fight just before Robbie Lawler, the Brazilian guy. And once he got his distance, and it just moved forward into into his face with a big elbow, and that was it. And uh, the the speed of this forward movement had been increased by his change of stance. Um, and, uh, and then with Robbie Lawler, uh, what we did was training him with a 
lot of a lot of kicks actually a lot a lot, a lot of kicks so it was a particular training that totally uh, complemented the work he was doing with his stri striking coach uh, Brandon Gibson who's a, like a, a master as his craft like world class uh, you know striking coach um, and what I what I did basically was like a I don't know in the computer world we would, we would talk about like a, an add-on or a plug-in or something like that that mm. a piece that it was very specific but essential to making all the rest work better. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. It makes a lot of sense because I think some people kind of might get kind of like lost in the weeds. They see like Conor McGregor working with Ido Portal and think okay, I need to move like a, a monkey more. I need to do, uh, you know, they see all these cool things and I, I like that kind of stuff too. But like when you, when you have somebody that's like an elite athlete that's coming to you, like you don't have, you're, you're dealing with such like a, somebody's bringing you a Lamborghini and you need to tune up that Lamborghini and you don't want somebody that's, it'd be real easy to do more harm than good, I would think. And so how do you think you developed your, your eye for that? How do you, how, how did you like pick out what to do for him? I don't know, maybe um, my friend and, uh, you know, well-renowned physical therapist and functional movement expert, Greg Cook. Mm -hmm. um, Big fan. Once told, you know, once told me, you're natural. So I don't know. I have my foundation for my work was never science. It's plain observation, observation, experiment, and it's just experiential knowledge. So it means that I, I don't look at numbers and data and, the, and, and science and surveys and all, all this kind of thing. That's not the, the, my starting point. That's not how I operate in terms of, of coaching. Um, I, I look at, you know, uh, I look at biomechanics, but again, without all the curves and all of this, I look at your points of support. I, I look at, the, you know, sequence and timing of movement, position, uh, tension and relaxation. I look at uh, mm -hmm. diversity of, of cues. Some are blatant and others are more subtle. Um, that that enable me to to know what needs to be worked on. Um, one would say it's it's intuitive, um, and in in, a, in a, a good part it is, but it can be also explained and uh, and described. Um, say, I look at the way people breathe. I look at the way people hold themselves and say when they move, if they move with fluidity or if they have tension. Um, yeah, foot placement, um, how the rest, whenever you want support on your hands, on your, on your knees, on your feet, how the rest of the body aligns, depending on the direction, the speed, where you want to go, where you want to land, what's the transition, there's just so many variables to, to look at. So I need to, to see, I need to look and um to observe and um yeah that's coaching it's one-on-one -on -one coaching hi I got, my son. I got my son showing up i think he's telling me hey uh, it's time <laughs> yeah um right. athlete here <laughs> natural athlete natural mover so when you're uh so when you're with your uh so like knowing what you know and like playing with your uh, uh, kids, like what do you, are you, are you trying to uh, like maybe like kind of like coach without coaching, maybe kind of like what it sounded like your dad did with you. He was like, we're, we're going out to the woods and we're having fun doing all these things. But really, you're, it sounded like your dad was like a really expert coach and maybe he didn't even know it. Actually, no, 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 not only he wasn't. Uh, he just uh, he j he gave me permission. He gave me an example of permission. He was not himself that good at, at movement, 
while mm. he was always telling me, hey, when I was a kid, I, I would climb trees and, uh, and do all these things. So he would provide the encouragement and like from early on in my, in my, in my psyche, that idea that all I was doing was not only natural and okay, it was totally okay, it was actually good and, and desirable. So it, you know, it reaches your, I did not think of it that way, but you know, it was in the back of my mind unconsciously. So that's pretty much what my dad did to me, but he not teach me techniques or, or much, except maybe I remember when he was telling me, climbing a tree, where to place my feet and how to, you know, push more from my feet and support my body more from my, my feet than just trying to hang and, and get exhausted. Um, so this being said, when you're asking about my, my kiddos, no, they're still young. So sky is four and eagle is five. Um, and, um, my job at this point is not to make natural movement in intellectual pursuit or something technical. Um, it is to encourage their exploration and their, and their spontaneous acquisition and development of, of skills. Um, so my support uh, is not intellectual, it's not conceptual. It is uh, context, it's to provide the context. So again, the, the permission to move naturally, to climb a tree, to jump a rock, not only the permission, but the encouragement. Um, and then from time to time, just early on actually, my kid was hanging, he was calling me because he was hanging to that wood rail we have, have just behind me. And he was scared because he was just above the, the staircase. And, uh, and I just walked slowly toward him, told him to just stay relaxed, not, not be afraid. And then I showed him what to do. I told him, hey, move your hands here. And I like, put your foot down there. Like extend your leg here, put your foot down, down there. I just made sure that he was secure. Well, the point was to make him realize that he was not in a, in a, in a movement situation that he could not actually fix. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was no actual uh, danger or, or there was only a risk if he did not trust that he had the ability to get out of this position. Um, and then, you know, but th that's it. Yeah. yeah. If, I, uh, if I see them climb trees outside, I'm not saying them, hey, come down and you're gonna hurt yourself or get dirty and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, if my, my kids start running, I might just start running with them. Uh, even if it's just uh, 50 yards, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and then show by example, they see me train, so they also jump and yeah. they, they crawl pretending they are jaguars and uh, uh, they jump over the ditch and uh, they do all these things. So the, the point here is not coaching, it's, it's support. It's mm -hmm. providing the context, authorizing and encouraging what they do naturally. Later on, when they grow up a little, um, I will start to teach them particular techniques which I've started doing with my, uh, my eight years old girl. So I started to teach, teach her techniques and she loves to move and she loves to achieve, say climbing something or jumping or something. And sometimes she, um, she's not too efficient. So I give her some cues and she apply them. She's like, whoa, that works right away. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, no. <laughs> so, would she ultimately figure it out by herself? Maybe yes and maybe no. You know, because again, what's natural is not necessarily efficient. Yeah. Anybody can jump again, but you're not necessarily good at it or jumping and landing. So doing a thousand repetitions may not give you solutions mm. to solve your 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 lack of efficiency, especially if you just jump and count and count and count and look at the clock for general conditioning, but without mindfully applying yourself to improve your skill with each and every single repetition you do. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Like all these 
So about these little subtle cues, just like a couple like little hints. I'm, uh, I know you got to go here in just a minute, but I'm, I'm uh, reading for the second time the talent code. And so they were like studying these different coaches like John Wooden and uh, like, what's he doing? And, you know, he wasn't like one of these big, like fire you up, big motivational speaker kind of guys. He was just like, like these like little adjustments, you know, kind of, I think kind of like what you were saying, put your foot here, uh, have your feet this way. And uh, just like these little subtle cues and like encouragement, like just at like the right times and just a, um, but it is, it's you know, to see these. I, I might be a little metaphorical here, but look at, say, what we call happiness, for instance. Happiness may not be the result of one big event that happens to you and makes, makes you happy. A big, a big, nice heaven, something, you know, that happens to you and really nice is going to make you happy. But then it's, it's short-lived if you don't have foundation in your own psyche for happiness in habits that promote and and maintain that state of happiness which is made of the accumulation of a number of little things mm -hmm. and those little things are both external having little pleasures little satisfaction but it's also your ability to appreciate to amplify your satisfaction of, wow, I'm eating this food and oh my God, this tastes good and paying attention and just be grateful because you're fed with healthy food. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna go your movement and instead of being a chore, you're forcing yourself to do. And even if it's hard, but you're like, I'm so grateful I have this ability to move and to, to stay strong and to make myself stronger and this and that, right? So you, it, it's, a, an accumulation is a succession of little strokes, both in terms of, say, physical behaviors and choices and things you do, but also in your own mind um, of, of how you operate, how you choose to operate your own mind that makes you happy. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So efficiency in techniques, um, especially if you work with athletes that are already specialized and already at an elite level, it's not going to be a massive epiphany uh, or every day, but, or maybe a, an epiphany in their world would be one little tweak that is barely perceptible that maybe people would not even notice. Just one little change in position um, in timing. In, in sequence and whatever in, in the way you breathe in position of your neck and head mm. in your line of vision whatever it is that brings you know something new on the table and improves what's already a skill but might just keeps optimizing it so mm. I'm not surprised that in that regard, most coaches for such athletes uh, may be looking at little, little, little details. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, very, uh, very cool. That's um, I know you got to uh, get going here. Um, so, is there uh, anything you wanted to that we haven't touched on that you're wanting to get into, or? Um, well, uh, my book is The Practice of Natural Movement. It's going to be released December 2018, um, finally. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this, and I know a lot of people are as well. So uh, it's on its way. It's coming. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be getting that for sure. It, it sounds really cool. Um, so any, any final uh, thoughts before we let you go? What are you, any uh, closing words to leave us with? Well, I invite you to um, check out movenat.com, M-O-V-N-A-T.com. This is where uh, you'll find all the information about the MoveNet method, what we do, uh, the workshops, the certifications uh, that are taking place worldwide. We operate uh, basically everywhere in the world. And then we have uh, online coaching. We have uh, licensed facilities. We have thousands of certified teachers around the world. 
So uh, yeah, if you want to delve into uh, this real world uh, physical capability yeah. method, um, that's the place to go to, to where to start smoothnet.com. Yeah, well, uh, thank you uh, very much for coming on. It, it was it was really cool. I've been a fan of your system for a, a, some time now, and uh, I'd be glad to have you on again anytime. So I will uh, stop the recording. I'll talk to you for just a second after I stop the recording. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, be well, everyone. Thanks.